Bridge Visual Storytelling Show, recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, comics.aadl. Man, I really flubbed that one. <laughs> comics.aadl.org uh, at the Ann Arbor Cut. District. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Uh, recorded on the AADL Netcast Studio on the corner of 5th and William in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And my name is Jersey Droz. This is the show where we talk about, uh, well, this is the show for cartoonists, comics advocates, and librarians and educators, anybody who is behind the scenes of comics. This isn't a fandom show. This is a, a making comics show and all the stuff that goes into that. And uh, today, man, oh, man, uh, brace yourselves because there's going to be a lot of talking and it's going to come fast and it's going to come hard. Uh, and our first first guy up in the pitcher's mound is Eli Nyberger of the Ann Arbor District Library, comics.aedl.org. Hey, Eli. How's it going, Jersey? <laughs> <laughs> you did that intro. Nice purpose. to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Practicing your John Machida, the Micro Machine Man. That's right. um, so you're going to co-host with me on this one, right? Yeah, I hope absolutely. so because uh, I don't. I don't want this to be just a simple interview. I want this to be a roundtable because we got a lot of stuff to share. Now, yeah. uh, Eli, you are the associate director of IT and production at the Ann Arbor District Library. That's right. Yeah. You're the the lead guy behind play.aadl.org, which we will no doubt talk about today. Yeah. Uh, leading a lot of great initiatives like comics.aadl.org and uh, comics digital libraries. And uh, this was your idea for this episode because uh, then as I turn to the next ep uh, guest, we've got Josh Elder of readingwithpictures.org. And Josh, you just uh, announced a really exciting initiative at C2E2. What was that, last week? Uh, two weeks ago now. Okay. Or, well, a week and a half and some change, and yeah. <laughs> but at, at C2E2 2012, uh, I, I forget what C2E2 stands for. It's a, a Chicago Comic Con kind of thing. It's the uh, Chicago <laughs> Comics, Comics and Entertainment and Expo. Entertainment right? Expo. There we go. There we go. In uh, 2012. Chicago so, Entertainment, yeah. But you announced a new initiative that, that, that uh, ties all three of us together. Um, and let me try to frame this before we dive into it is that, uh, you know, we, we live in this age where everybody's talking about disintermediation, removing the middlemen. The Internet's pulling out all these salespeople and distributors, and it's a very exciting time for the independent publisher and for content creators. Is, is that a douchey term to use? Oh, I don't think so. Okay, yeah. people who make stuff. How about that, Internet? Don't put me on Klaus bag. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, Klauschback. Have you heard about this? I have. I'm pretty sure that's not the way it's pronounced. <laughs> but <laughs> oh, well, I thought it was like Klausch and douchebag, so it was a Klauschback. Right. Whatever, yeah. whatever yeah. it is, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, it's an exciting time. But th then again, you know, it's like uh, one of the things that I think that if, if, if you'll forgive me for saying this, we're all kind of brothers in arms in this sense is that uh, we all represent fields which have been uh, historically in the 20th century kind of misunderstood or um, neglected or not treated with the, the due deference that, that we think it deserves. You know, you represent libraries and you're, you're doing your damnedest to make libraries cool again, and I think you're doing <laughs> it. Uh, and, then, and then guys like Josh and me are trying to make comics cool, and then, uh, and then you say, well, uh, we need, my, my position is that we need a middleman, a, a translators, uh, bridge characters to help bring our particular fields to the public eye because like, let's talk about like uh you know well marvel and dc they've got comics for kids and whenever people say that i, I think of that line from the blues brothers right we got both kinds of music country and western right, <laughs> right. <laughs> um and then they got them in the comic the store good old superhero boys <laughs> right yeah. which which are great i love superheroes right. but but they got both kinds superhero and more superhero or well they also have horror i guess but then they're also at destination sites like comic book stores and then they say well we got them for kids and then the kids don't buy them they go well i guess kids don't want comics yes they do we, they're right. just not you're not getting them to the kids and uh, anyway so my, my my first point is that anybody who's listening and going like oh boy you're going to talk about digital licensing and digital libraries what's this got to do with comics this is important stuff everybody because we need translators to work with institutions to make them realize the importance of comics and of digital media and ways to use digital media right. Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. So, okay. So let's let's talk about your thing, Josh. Let's talk about this thing that you talked about that you uh, announced this uh, Iverse Media's Comic Plus Library Edition and why this is so interesting. Um, okay. Well, uh, I mean, the reason we think it's so exciting is that. Uh, it, it really was designed with input from librarians. Like Eli actually was, was one of our sort of um, uh, uh, survey subjects and kind of we, we did a lot of back and forth on what this thing should be. You know, how do we take it beyond just being a typical vendor experience that librarians have to deal with? And then on the, the patron side, 
how do we make this as as seamless and as as excellent, you know, uh, that you feel like this is a consumer experience, but it's happening through the library. How do we deliver that too? Um, and then from my POV personally, I'm a content creator. I'm a stuff maker, a maker of stuff myself. And, you know, I wanted to make sure that uh, whatever terms uh, were given to, to publishers, to independent creators, um, were eminently equitable. And, you know, so we tried to balance all those things. And we think we've done a pretty, pretty solid job of it. Um, and, you know, with iVersus technology and the content partnerships that they have in place, people like Archie, Marvel, um, uh, IDW, Ape, uh, you know, that we're now, you know, getting all locked in for this uh, digital service. Um, we think that this is a real, you know, potential game changer, like, uh, you know, more content available to more people um, where they are. You know, if, if the thing is we need to get, you know, we want to get more kids reading comics, you know, for all sorts of reasons, we can agree that that's a good thing. Um, but how do you do it? Well, you've got to go where they are. And, you know, this is where they are. They're in libraries and they're in schools. Um, so take it to them and give it in a way, give it to them in a way that they can, can access easily and cheaply. Now, I want to hear from your perspective, Eli, why this is important, the way they're doing it, because this isn't the first library licensing initiative. We've got things like Overdrive. Why is right. this one different? Well, there's a lot of challenges, uh, in, in doing this in a library context. One of the biggest things is that libraries are about lending and there's a fundamental incompatibility in between the notion of digital objects and lending them. Because why would you, why would you lend someone a digital object? Yeah. Why would you not just give them a copy? Well, <coughs> our current business models that are built around it are, are assuming a, a finite number of copies, right? Mm -hmm. So it's challenging to make business models that have grown up around the notion of copies as finite objects and make them work in a library context where the very, because you know, there's not really a difference between selling a download to someone and, you know, lending them an item. You know, what's, right. the, what's really the functional difference about that and having temporary access to it? So, you know, there's a lot of products out there, but most of it is powered or most of it is driven by the fact that uh, in the boardrooms of the publishers, and, you know, we're talking about big, big publishers, not certainly not independent media, but in the boardrooms of the big, big publishers, um, they view the internet as having one giant pirate hat on it, right? You know, and it's just it's just a cloud with a pirate hat, you know. Well, I, I okay, you're, you're you're going where I wanted you to go. Well, not where I wanted you to go, but you're going to the place that I hoped we would go. Let me put it that way. I'm not no, not manipulating. Am I people. clown? No. Am I here to entertain <laughs> you? Right. But we're going to talk more about this Iverse thing because there's a lot of details yes. in this. But one of the things that I think is really interesting is so you did a talk. We talked about this before, but it's something I think a lot of people, anybody who makes stuff on the internet, should watch this talk. And it was a uh, talk you did in Australia. What was the conference name? It was called Vo v I'm trying to pronounce the Australian <laughs> one. Vola. 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 V-A-L-A. -A, Vala. <laughs> which is the Victorian Association for Library Automation. One of those uh, acronyms that has outlived its own tent. But it was a great conference. I had fun putting the talk and together. You did a talk called Access Schmaccess. Yep. Uh, thanks for that <laughs> tongue twister. And uh, one of the th cases you made, in, to preface your whole position, was you have to understand internet culture. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about why understanding that is so important. Because, man, the, once you framed up what Internet culture is and how information sharing works, it made me realize that, yeah, you know, it's like this whole Kindle e-lending thing where it's like, I got it for a few days. This doesn't right. make any sense. It's for boomers. I yeah. mean, it seriously is. It's the, the physicalized business models mm -hmm. are – and really, if you look at who's buying e-books, it's boomers. Right. And, you know, that is the majority audience. It's not that younger people aren't reading them. But they know where their, you know, the publishers know where their bread is buttered, mm -hmm. and it's over 50. And that's not a way to build a, phys uh, you don't build forward-looking business models on audiences that are over 50. You right. know, so part of, partially, it's, we're in this transition phase right now. But it's really the, I think, you know, as a parent and as someone who works at the library, the generation gap is simultaneously larger and smaller than it's ever been, in that there's such a big cultural gap between people who are, in essence, internet people. And, you know, I mean that in both, both senses of the word. Uh, there's a big gap between internet people and non-internet people, you know. Right. And that, um, you know, when I showed in my talk in Australia, I showed Nyan Cat as part of the talk. And I was yep. like, raise your hand if, you've, if this is your first time you've ever seen Nyan Cat. 
and about 80% of the thousand people in the room raised their hand. Okay. You know, I gave the same talk recently in Texas, and there was a group of teenagers in the room, ah. and I was like, now you guys know, and, and they were like, oh, yeah, yeah, we know. I mean, it's just, there's ubiquity to internet culture that people seem to overlook, and it's, and so you've got this big generation gap between internet culture and non-internet culture. At the same time, you know, you have properties that are going multi-generational that were never multi-generational before. Oh. You know, it's like, I'm not into any of the properties that my dad was into, you know? Mm-hmm. Howdy Doody, Lone Ranger, sure, you yeah. know, Benny Goodman. None of that shit is is what I'm into. But the stuff I was into as a kid, Star Wars, Voltron, yeah. you know, um, uh, Pokemon, Nintendo, uh, you know, Mario. Yeah. Those properties are every bit as vibrant in my kids' generation yep. as they were for mine. Because so they're, they're, ac- they're accessible all the time, 24-7, via things like YouTube or torrents. And Yeah, the, the eye-opening moment for me came two, two years ago. I was teaching a class, and I was doing some sketches for the kids uh, at the end of class, and a kid said, will you draw me Cobra Commander? And I thought, oh, geez, I'm going to have to look up a picture of the movie Cobra Commander with that <laughs> stupid breathing apparatus and everything. I'm like, all right, well, let me look it up. And I like, look up. thought we weren't going to talk religion on this show. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Uh, uh, his crunchberry head is like, <laughs> oh, killed me. Like, uh. Well, he's he's got the silver mask in the new movie, so it looks like it might be okay. But anyway, uh, so I'm I'm drawing that 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 doofy helmet, and the kid's like, no, no, the real one, the real one. And I'm the like, well, one. what's the real one? And he's like, well, you know, he's got a silver mask with a blue helmet. And I'm like, how do you, this kid's 12, right? right. I'm like, that was 25 years ago. How do you know about this? And I said, did uh, your dad YouTube. watch it? And yeah. he's like, he's like, well, I watch it online. And I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, all this stuff is available to these people all the time. There is no, this ain't your daddy's entered property name here, right. right? So yeah, that's an important point to make. But also, I mean, it's like, okay, we talk about Iverse Media. Uh, oh, we got an iOS app. Good for you. Uh, but Libraries have a special consideration there in that not everybody who uses the library has an iPad, right? Well, and there's, you know, there's a couple of different angles on that part of it in that, you know, libraries usually don't want to deploy uh, platform-specific solutions. Mm-hmm. But at the right. same time, it's like we also, we circulate DVDs. That's a platform-specific solution. It's That's not true. a device-specific solution, but it's platform-specific. Yeah. You know, so it's not like that ground isn't plumbed. It's just you need to have sufficiently broad audiences. And I think what's yeah. exciting about the Iverse option is really the business model and the way that you can, the way that it is is designed around uh, libraries' fears, which are how libraries make decisions, mm-hmm. and not around the publishers' fears. I think that I think Josh and his, his team did a really good job, kind of walking the line between the rights holders' interests mm-hmm. and the library purchasers' interests, because while libraries are a small, per- small percentage of publishing revenue, you know, like less than 5% across all publishing, in graphic novels, it's not like that. I mean, libraries are responsible. I read one statistic. 30% or more of all graphic novel sales are to libraries. So it's very different in comics publishing. We actually have leverage as yeah. libraries. I, I want to say this again. Okay, so, yeah, I think, Josh, you had that in, as a statistic in one of your talks or in one of your interviews that you did. Um, where it was 30 to 40% of graphic novel sales are happening in libraries. Now, there's your statistic for anybody who's listening of something I've said a bunch of times is that libraries and schools are the front ground. That's the front battleground that we need to hit because that's where the kids are and that's where you find the audience who's looking for this stuff because we don't have spinner racks anymore, right? <laughs> and it's not cheap disposable entertainment anymore. It's, it's four bucks. I can't even afford four bucks for a monthly book. So anyway... Uh, but yeah, yeah. So, and I want to just clarify this point. I said something about an iOS app, but they, there's also the thing about this iVerse uh, digital library editions is it's going to be have a web version, right? So anybody with a browser can do it, uh, and it's also going to have uh, Android and Kindle versions as well, right? So it, it pretty yeah. much hits it buckshots right. every p- conceivable. It, basically, platform. I mean, and we'll, we're actually working on stuff for the Kobo even right now too. So I mean, it'll be it'll be on everything, yeah. um, and you know, worst case scenario, you just took them up to the terminal at the library itself, um, and they can view it there. So I mean, it it really is uh, everywhere. I mean, we're rolling out the new the new uh, iVerse platform that will be powering this whole thing um, in the next couple weeks. Um, I mean, it exists now, like I've seen it, um, but uh, you know, they want to they all want to time their you know press releases and stuff. So. <laughs> sure exactly when it's actually going to hit the the consumer space but um i mean it's it's really exciting and um you know whatever whatever device they have they'll be able to access the content on it um and and real quick about that uh that statistic as well 
like that. So uh, about 10%, and well, actually probably 12 or 13 by now because it's been consistently growing, um, of the overall, like the entire graphic novel market in the United States is library and school purchases. Um, so right there, you're already looking at double the average for um, traditional publishing. Now that 30 to 40 percent uh, is uh, true for um, children's titles, like uh, you know something like Toon Books or uh, Amelia Rules by Jim Gownley or right. something like that. Um, then that's where you're getting some of those really big numbers um, percentage-wise. So for that that target audience. Um, which you know is the largest and which is the most underserved audience in the traditional comic marketplace. Um, absolutely, the libraries and the schools are you know the, the single largest uh, purchaser um, in the country. You know, Josh, maybe you could mention a little bit about um, you know given the road you took to get to this point, um, what problem you set out to solve? Because you know it's very. I touched a little bit on kind of the the challenge of of lending in a digital context, but it's, a, mm -hmm. you know, it's a little bit deeper than that. When, when you guys in, embarked on this project, what was the, you know, what was the problem you were hoping to solve? Well, I mean, on a, on a philosophical level, I guess. And, and the thing that, that really drives me in everything that I do, um, is that I believe comics as a medium have extraordinary untapped potential to, to better the lives of pretty much everyone they come in contact with, um, especially young people. Um, you know, hooked on comics work for me. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think it can work for everybody. And so that's what drives pretty much everything that I do. And so, you know, one of the chief problems that I, that I identified, because I did and still do workshops all across the country um, from my days as a, as a comic book writer, you know, telling, you know, I do storytelling workshops and comic creating workshops and I go to schools and libraries all over and I kept encountering these same issues. It's like, we'd love to do more with this, but there are institutional barriers. We don't know how to do it. There's the knowledge problem. How do we select the right material? Um, and then the, the last one that was, wasn't spoken of as much, but was definitely there was simply cost. Um, right. the cost of a typical graphic novel um, is even a, like a manga is more than a paperback book. Um, and the, uh, you know, to acquire a library basically from scratch, because a lot of libraries are essentially starting at zero, um, or close to it, they have enough trouble just keeping up with the contents coming out, um, every month, much less going backwards into the backlist to actually start building a true library. And so the issue seemed to be, you know, a fundamental barrier was uh, price, availability, and knowledge, the knowledge problem, you know, selecting the right titles. And so I knew that any digital service that would actually meet those needs had to remove the question of selection, like the content just had to be there and the patrons would be able to kind of find their own way or the librarians would be able to curate it, but they'd be able to pull from a vast catalog of titles without any risk. I mean, they wouldn't have to invest in a title first before adding it to the collection. Um, and then I knew that, you know, the, um, you know, we had to get it clo as close to that magic number of 50 cents per circulation um, that uh, librarians need. I mean, that, that that's what they use to measure. That's the metric. Um, you know, if you hit that, then you're a cost-effective circulation. Yeah. And so I had to make sure that we got that. Um, and then, of course, it just had to be accessible everywhere because, you know, my mother's a school librarian. And in the middle school where I, where I went to school, and we don't have iPads uh, there. We don't have um, Kindle Fires. We don't have those devices. We have computer terminals. Um, and so if that solution was going to work for her, and it's my mom, better work for my mom, um, <laughs> then, you know, it had to be on every device. And that was, those were the guiding principles behind developing the service. And, you know, you're absolutely right. It was librarian focused. I mean, I actually go so farther to say it was patron focused mm -hmm. and it was, how do I get this to them? And then, so I addressed the librarian's needs 
And then I went back to the publishers and said, okay, I can triple your per checkout income um, uh, over print with this digital service. Um, and when I put it that way, when I say 50 cents to quote unquote rent a graphic novel, they, they freak out a little bit. But then I say, well, they're doing that now with print and right. you're only making um, 11 about cents or, yeah. 11 cents. <laughs> Um, you are only making about 11 cents per circulation. I can triple that. And then they're like, oh. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's uh, different then. And I'm like, you're right, it is. Their eyes turn into little dollar signs. And, yeah, well, and yeah. Like, well, you said cents. people make decisions based on fear, right? Yeah. So you, you and, and something that, Josh, you were saying is that you're moving risk. You remove risk. And this is a, a, a time-honored teaching technique is diminishing the risk so the students will participate in the activity, right? And that's, that's, yeah. that's the way people work. Uh, I'm... I'm, I'm what you're saying, and I want to just back up and like get a little abstract for a second, is like because we want to talk about licensing and the future right. of licensing. Um, and I wanted to pick apart some things that you were saying in there, Josh, is that you said you needed it to be accessible everywhere, right? It's not on one platform, and so right. well, I just got to get a Kindle, I guess. Uh, and then meeting a certain cost threshold. Um, I'm thinking there's got to be some kind of DRM on this, right? There's got to be some kind of protection to keep people from stealing this stuff and passing around to all their buddies, right? Um, so there is to a degree. Um, I mean, Iverse has uh, essentially the, the format that we would be circulating is proprietary to us. Um, I mean, if it can be broken, anything can be. I'm, mm -hmm. And I'm sure, honestly, they probably don't want me saying this. I'm sure someone has. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it uh, the the goal of of it, it's sort of like um, you can install a whole bunch of protections on your on your TV or your computer to keep your kid from looking at stuff they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. But the best way to do that is to tell your kid don't do that and convince them that it's, you know, wrong for them to do so. Um, and if they feel that that's legitimate, then they won't do it. And if you feel uh, that you're getting a reasonable price for for this, like the service that you're getting is fair and everyone's being treated fairly and this is reasonable and right, mm -hmm. then they won't even try to crack it. Um, well, that, I mean, why yeah. should they? They can just check the book out again next week if they want to read That's it. That's exactly the point you made in your Access Schmaxes talk, Eli, about yeah. iTunes, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when you fall below a certain, I mean, it's the impulse threshold. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's nothing further below the impulse threshold than digitally checking out an item from the library if you don't have to wait. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and it's it's the... Uh, it's the waiting and the physicalization that is the problem with the current DRM strategies that we have in ebooks. But you know, also a lot of that is is just driven by a you know a, a boogeyman, you know, a mm -hmm. perception of a, of a of a pirating boogeyman, and you know the the mistaken belief that things that are protected by DRM are not already out there for the taking. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like they're trying to, you know, they want to keep their thumb in the crack in the dike, but they're already in water up to their neck. Yeah. You know, so it's like, it's kind of, you know, so the whole thing with DRM, it's, it's simultaneously a very major issue when it comes to libraries because you have a lot of libraries that are paying extra for the DRM, mm -hmm. you know, and what that means is you have public institutions spending public money on technology that does nothing other than restrict access to information. Yeah, that's great. That's not really a good use <laughs> of public dollars. Yeah. No. You know? No, it's so not. I, I, so, and the, the thing about, you know, business models that are more like this is that even if there's DRM in the distribution equation, the entire relationship isn't structured around it. Right, you right. Know? That's where I wanted to go with that. Yeah, is that is that you're, you're, what you're doing is, because like I could, as a content maker, as a maker of things, I could say, well, gee, what do I need you for, Josh, to do this? Because I could just go to the library and say, hey, here's my webcomic for free. Put it on your website. Right. You know, I've got an RSS feed. Syndicate it, for crying out loud. But this isn't, <laughs> it's the weird thing, the, the weird thing that we have to like flip a switch in our brains about, and there's another point that you made in the Access Schmaxes talk, is this isn't about delivering content. It's about providing a service. Uh, mm -hmm. I did a tour last year visiting 23 different libraries doing comics workshops in uh, promotion of the Kids Read Comics event, which we'll talk about at the end of the show. Um, 
And I asked at every one of these stops, whenever I was confronted with a receptive librarian, and I said, like, what are you thinking about in terms of building a digital collection for your place? And they go, oh, gee, you know, man, money, uh, infrastructure. We don't have a computer guy. And so it really dawned on me at that point that, yeah, we need somebody to come along and provide a built-in service where you just pay a small amount of money, and they do all the infrastructure work, and what they're paying for is the service to the curated uh, content, right? It's not paying for the content itself as much as it is paying for an easy way to get to it. Is that, right. is that the point you were making in yeah, your talk? Yeah, I mean, is that you're, you're licensing. I mean, people aren't paying for access. They're paying for convenience. Yeah. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Nobody's like, oh, I'm paying my $8 so I can access this song. Right. You know, they can access it without paying the $8. Mm. You know, and, yeah. uh, and well, and frankly, it's part of why the ebook business is booming so well. Because the ebook audience doesn't know you can get it out there for free. You know what I mean? <laughs> Generationally, you're dealing with an audience that is unaware of BitTorrent. Right. You know? Right. Or, and boy, you can make a lot of money selling digital objects to people who don't know what BitTorrent is. <laughs> you know? What are you going to say, Josh? Well, I mean, I think they know. I think they're just like assume that the moment they step on one of those sites, that um, they get vanned. You know, somebody in, uh, you know, someone in Nigeria. Will immediately right, steal right. their identity. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know. yeah, it's amazing how well the media has placed into the boomer mind the first impulse of an intruder is affecting my machine. I didn't click on the wrong window. An yeah. intruder did it. Yes. And it's like that's always the first assumption is they're, that there's a hacker. They're Matthew all... Broderick is at the <laughs> other end of the line. Yeah. And Angelina Jolie. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah. So, so I think that's a great, w a great way, to, great way to frame this for for the makers of stuff. Is that it's it's about if you're going to try to monetize your stuff, you monetize the the ease of delivery of the stuff, right? And and uh, and then we talk about uh, Rich Stevens, who you, another yeah. guy that you talk about a lot, uh, Diesel Sweeties, who did a Kickstarter campaign for his free comic. Right. It's free. You to can... bundle his free comics into a free ebook. An ebook. It yeah. wasn't even to get a printed book. Right. It was just, I want to make something that's really easy for you to read everything I've ever right. done. And then how much did he wind up 60 raising? 60 grand. $60,000 he raised. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, I think that it's not, I mean, yeah, it's about making awesome stuff, but it's about making awesome stuff that's easy for people to get to. Now, I want to get at this licensing thing. I want to talk about, like, what, what do you guys see as the future of licensing? Because that was, that was one of the things you pitched at me, Eli. Well, there's a couple different pieces here and it's again one thing that's interesting about the iverse option is that you know when libraries it's not like licensing is new to libraries we've been licensing big expensive databases for a long time mm -hmm. the the thing that's different is that now we're getting content in them that people actually want to read want to use you know where <laughs> we've been licensing you know uh magazine indexes and consumer reports and you know newspaper all that stuff we've been indexing that paying annually for unlimited access for that time that model is well established, and frankly, libraries are willing to pay much more for those than they're worth because the content that's behind them tends to be stuff that librarians believe to be essential. You okay. know? But in this case, when you're starting to get into, into recreational content, what's really exciting to me is the possibility of, you know, that business model can actually work extremely well for an individual creator because it's all about, you know, moving the risk. You know, mm -hmm. th there's there's something speculative about publishing. Well, basically, sp publishing is speculative. Yeah. You know, yeah. Physical publishing is a speculative business. Uh, I, I, I want to just jump on that real quick for those who don't think it is for those who are going like, well, no, it's not. Uh, when you go to a comic store, they say, don't read. This isn't a library. Just buy it and get out. Right. So in other words, you are being asked to go in to pay money for a product when you don't even know if it's any good yet or not. Right. And I um, mean. And then you take it home and you find out, I just paid four bucks for this thing and I didn't like it after all. Boy, wouldn't it be great if I could have had a chance to read this beforehand? So it's speculative on the part of the consumer and on the part of the oh, publishers. Yeah. The yeah. publisher's taking a gamble when they print it, when they give an advance, any of that stuff. Yeah. It's all speculative business. Right. And I think that that's really the biggest shift that's going to hit publishing mm -hmm. is that they will not be able to afford to be speculative anymore. And then you've got authors who grew up on royalty, uh, not not on royalties, because you know it's one in a thousand authors who makes a meaningful living off of royalties. Yeah, I remember. You I know? remember he reading somebody. Uh, it was a well pub a well known author. I think it might have been uh, Stackpole, the guy who does all those Star Wars books. Mm -hmm. I think you said something like he makes eight cents a book. Yeah, I mean, it's, you yeah. know, they're making almost no money on royalties. Yeah, they make money from advances, but that's speculative, you know. And, mm -hmm. and of course, that's why corporate content falls into such narrow silos is because they want to minimize the risk. They want to do Star Wars, Knights of the Old Republic, 
by you know yeah. eighteen <laughs> because that's not a risky investment. So yeah. I think it's really about what the value is, and it, like I talked about in the talk, and I'm sure we'll get to as as we go here, is that increasingly being a creator is building a fan base and monetizing a fan base, mm -hmm. not selling access to your work. And when you well, start to get products like this, uh, I think it, it moves very much in that direction. Go ahead, Josh. Well, I mean, I think that, so I, I've done, and we're in the middle of another Kickstarter right now for Reading with Pictures, and we did one before, and you know, it wasn't the product that, that sold. It was access to it. The single most valuable thing that we had um, as a reward was being drawn into the book, like becoming a character in the book mm -hmm. and, and personalization and things like that, like either engaging directly um, with the artists or becoming a part of the narrative, becoming a part of the story itself. And that kind of brand engagement, if you ever go to a uh, artist alley in, in any, any comic convention, especially at like an anime or manga show, um, and you'll find uh, an enormous amount of people who are essentially selling. So like they have a webcomic, for instance, that again, they give away for free Diesel Sweetie style. What they sell you are ways to connect to that brand and to that idea, right. whether it's T-shirts or plushies or stickers or prints, whatever that is, it's basically finding and engaging in a powerful way with that fan base and you know we see this in media all the time like you know uh, the most the most money most spider-man money doesn't come from spider-man comics or even the movies it comes from all the merchandise that surrounds spider-man um but that's always been considered like a big brand kind of thing but now that's become uh uh available to to the little guy as well to essentially create a brand for themselves and to merchandise you know, themselves, you know, the, the content you just give, the content gets you hooked. And then once they're invested in your product, your idea, then that's when you sell them, you upsell them all this other stuff. Right. It's like the, the, the content is the content is the razor, you know, the razor yeah, handle the, the Gillette and, thing, and, yeah. uh, and the, the t-shirt or the blades. Yeah. You know? And I think that, that there's a lot of creators who haven't gotten there yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? So can I uh, play devil's advocate uh, or Luddite, whatever you want to call it, and be and say, uh, oh, gee, so you're talking about speculation? That's speculation. I got to work for a couple years for nothing in order to build this audience. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, I, it is a speculative act to think are mm -hmm. people going to like my stuff. Yeah. That's speculation. But what you leverage in your personal financial life is entirely up to you. And I think the thing that has changed the most is that to be a successful comic artist with a global following, you don't have to leverage shit. I mean, you can, for five bucks a month, you could conceivably be a comic artist with a, a global following. Now, you know, it's not going to be millions of people for five bucks a month of hosting. Right. But you can reach a global audience with nothing, with, with pennies. But I think an important thing to make a distinction here is, and this is something I'm, I'm just beginning to wrap my brain around, is... Because that this has been an exciting topic for the last ten years, uh, you know, it's like we don't have to ask permission from some jerk to make our book come true, right? Right. And I think a miscommunication happens with some people where they think, well, that just means I deserve an audience. To which I, I say <laughs> to them, well, no, no, it means that instead of asking this one jerk whether or not you can have your book, now you have to ask the whole world whether or not you can have your book. You can still make it. It just doesn't mean that you're going to be able to make a living off it. That's the part where you have to ask permission and, and be worthy of your audience in order to be able to make a living off of the book. Does that sound fair? Well, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, if if you're in the eyeball business, eyeballs have to like you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, not not necessarily as a person, but if you're in the eyeball business, your content has to be eyeball friendly. You yeah. know, okay. I don't think I don't think there's getting away from uh, from quality. <laughs> you know, if anything, the Internet has shown us that basically the publishing industry that was not 99% crap was a temporary aberration in human culture. Mm. And that 99% crap is what human culture is. And the web is going to be like that too. And publishing is yep. going to be like that too. Television is rapidly approaching that asymptotically. <laughs> you know, and there's, there's a, lot of different, a lot of different pieces in there. But you know, um, <laughs> there's always going to be uh, what you might call treehouse builders 
in in mm. content creators, which are like, oh, I'm going to build this treehouse. It's going to be really awesome. I'm going to have a keg and internet access and a recliner, <laughs> and you know, it's going to be really great. And it's like, that dude, would be an awesome treehouse. It would be, <laughs> yeah. And it's like, dude, you don't know how to. You don't own a yard. You don't have carpentry skills. Mm. You don't know anything about roofing. You know, there's to deliver things to eyeballs that eyeballs want to see takes skill and development and you know it's the 10,000 hour rule. Yeah. You know, you're not going to have a global audience if you aren't very good at something. Yeah. You know? And and, and yeah, and, and I don't think we need to go any further into uh, discussing what quality actually means. Uh, I think our listeners and, and viewers are smart enough to understand that quality means a lot of different things, right? Um, but I want to get back to this licensing thing. So, like, we're talking about this, this, uh, you know, this model of reaching out to libraries uh, for recreational content. Like, what other ways do you see this happening? Because it, it, the ADL did play around with a music. Yeah. Lending service yeah, it's going for great. Is yeah, it still going? Oh yeah, absolutely. Awesome. And and then that one was really interesting because there's like absolutely no DRM on it, if I'm not That's mistaken. Right. That's right. And basically it's partially that, that we as an institution are saying we're not gonna pay for DRM. Awesome. We're not gonna pay for it. You know? And that uh, if we're gonna distribute and the other part of it is, and this is the hard part that's hardest for publishers to understand, no DRM means that if you just that you're not lending something. You can't lend an object in the absence of DRM, a digital object, because right. you're putting it on their computer. If you don't have DRM, you can't make them take it off. You know, yeah. So really what it is, is it's a download, a downloading model, yeah. not a lending model. Right. And we're still in this phase now where we have a lot of creators who are conflating the physical sale with the download because they know there are some customers who will get the download and not do the physical sale. But, you know, bits don't have economic value. And that's one of the big points from, from this talk yeah. is that, you know, right now we are seeing lots of businesses that are trying to treat the zeros and the ones as if they are equivalent in value to atoms. Mm -hmm. And that's, that will never be the case. Not even once we have, you know, teleportation <laughs> and nano assembly and all that <laughs> stuff. You know, atoms have value. Bits don't. And right. I think that that's... Part of the model. But, and basically, but there's a way in which libraries can purchase a fixed term license to distribute, not to lend, but to distribute there we digital go. objects to their cardholders. That's a good way of you putting know? it. And that what we do is we say, we'll pay you X for the right to distribute the content that you define, which we will call Y. We'll pay you X to get Y for our patrons unlimited, unlimited downloads for a set term. Yep. So it's not forever. Right. You know, it's not forever. Now, the, the people who download it have it forever. Mm -hmm. But you just made another fan. Yep. You know, and it's... I think, I think that's an interesting way to put it. Like a, a, a friend of mine, Rob Stenzinger of uh, interactive-storyteller.com, so we, were, we were hawking around about uh, social media SEO gurus, you know, like those right. like, uh, life coaches uh, that you always find on Twitter. It's like, I'll help yeah. you get a million followers, right. and they're still, they're still around. The only uh, thing missing from SEO is the N-A-K and the I-L. <laughs> Wait, S-E-O, N-E-K. N-A-K. Put the N-A-K the N -A -K between the S and the E, and then the I-L after the O, and then um. you got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Sorry. Uh, but the, 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 Rob said to me, he's like, whenever I hear that, I hear that I represent 200 thumbs ups. You know, that's that's like what they're trying to sell you on. And, and I thought, yeah, that really, really is a good translation of it. And like, how thumbs can you up what? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but 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 then you t when you call a library uh, a distribution focal point. Right. Then you really are. You know, it's like you got how many people are card carrying members? Well, yeah. I mean, we routinely have about fifty five thousand active borrowers 55, and about one hundred and ten thousand known borrowers who you know? are gobbling up content from the library. Right. So, as a content maker, it's like, yeah, I want to be, I want to get in on that, right? So, like, yeah, I, I, I think that that's that's the, the the switch that needs to be flipped in a lot of stuff makers' heads. Right. And it's not hard for us as a library to say to a creator we can easily pay you more than you ever would have made from these 55,000 people. Well, that was the point Josh made earlier, isn't it? You know, you, you, uh, with 50 cents per uh, borrowing sale, right? That, that's more than the 11 cents, I guess, it would make? I don't well, know. Well, I mean, the, uh, you know, 11 cents is like if you, if you buy something and then it circulates until it falls apart. Right. You know, that's, that's kind of the, the, the paper model there. But, you know, mm -hmm. I think there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of potential to do this. And basically... Um, the, the thing that I think is the most at risk is the, the notion that a publisher is, is going to get a 70% margin, you know, I think going forward. And, and, and granted, you know, it, 
There's a lot of different business models out there, but you know, a lot of the challenge that we're seeing in the book world is driven by enormous payrolls and Times Square rents. Mm-hmm. You know, and the value that they're bringing to the equation isn't necessarily matched by the value they're extracting from the transaction anymore. And I think right. that's really the, 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 the untenable position. So, um, Josh, I have to ask you, uh, as, as a guy who makes stuff, uh, is, is this Iverse Media Comics Plus Digital Library Editions, is this open to all, or is this something, I mean, what's, what's the process of getting involved uh, for, the, for the people who are listening who make stuff? Um, email me. <laughs> like, I, it really is that easy. Um, it's just josh at iversemedia.com. And I'll, you know, we, we, we have, it has to be approved by um, kind of the upper management. But basically, as long as we don't find your content morally objectionable, um, and, you know, that's a, that you have to be pretty extreme um, <laughs> for that to be the case, uh, then, yeah, typically, you know, it's a, our service, you know, we take on the risk of bringing on publishers. So, I mean, you may end up if you know you're you want to if you're self publishing and self distributing a comic, um, and you want to get it on Iverse, it may end up towards the back of the queue, at, you know, behind the next batch of Archie and you know IDW and Marvel. Um, but you know, we'll we'll get you in there, and um, you know, I'm a I'm a big uh, I am a self-publisher. I am a supporter of, of that space and of the people doing it um, in every conceivable way. And honestly, um, a lot of what we would term like corporate comics, uh, you know, not not to I don't want to throw a stone at at at, at anybody here, but a lot of what we we term is like the 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 big the big big market big company comics. Honestly often don't do as well in libraries as more independent titles. Um, I mean, the manga explosion alone, you know, is, is proof of that where something that wasn't anything um, to anybody aside from like people who were ex- extremely interested in the format. And so they cared about, you know, Otomo and, 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 um, uh, you know, uh, and Tezuka and stuff like that. Right. But then it, it was put in that content was put in front of the audience and not the audience that shops at comic shops and not the audience that was shopping at, at bookstores at the time because, you know, bookstore graphic novels didn't really exist then. But when it was put in front of an audience and libraries were honestly one of the most important sort of vectors to spread manga in this country, um, they ate it up, you know? And, and so there's a real differential where, the stuff that really matters in the direct market or even in the bookstore market isn't necessarily what matters or not as much in the library market. There's a lot of asymmetries that I think everyone can benefit from um, in the library marketplace. Yeah, I mean, you know, that, that touches directly on one of the big challenges for libraries and that over the past 20 or 30 years, libraries have leveraged themselves to, toward hotness. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Having enough compete with copies borders. of the hottest thing. We got to compete with borders. Well, we won that one. You know, <laughs> yeah. so there's there's a uh, <laughs> point, a blockbuster. You know, wag of the finger. You're next. Um, but you know, there's the. It doesn't make sense for libraries to invest public money in having stacks of things that are also at the checkout register at the grocery store, mm-hmm. and stacks of things that are also in the checkout. You know, also at Target, and Best Buy, and you know if if there's a thousand copies of something within five miles of a library location, it's probably not that important that the library has tons of them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's the stuff that isn't anywhere for a hundred miles in any direction. Mm-hmm. That's where the value of library collections are. And I think that that's a big part of why we you know, became sort of a champion for the underdog, because that's what people were looking for, because they could get Archie and X-Men everywhere. Right. You know, they couldn't avoid the Archie and the X-Men. Well, and, you know? and I mean, the other thing to understand is that library patron is a, is a completely different thing than the, the, the traditional uh, checkout lane reader in that, I mean, I've got anecdotal evidence to this effect, is I was, it, it was at the Northeast Branch years ago when there was a Northeast Branch, and now it's the Traver, Traverwood Branch. Yep. Uh, and, and there was a teenage girl flipping through the comic section, and I leaned over and I said, hey, is there anything you're looking for? I can help you out maybe. And she said, no, I just read everything. 
read everything. You know, it's like that was unthinkable 20 years ago when it was, hey, this isn't a library, get out, right? right? Buy the book and get out. You didn't get to browse and you didn't get to travel. And so we have people who just consume everything they can in that yeah. format. And, and it's sort of like, it reminds me of the Netflix thing where now how we... Uh, sort of flip through shows and flip, we flip through movies the way we used to flip through shows. It's like watch five minutes of a movie and like, eh, I don't really care because it's streaming. I don't right, care. I'll just right. shut it off and put on something else, right? Uh, so you get you get a constituency that tries more stuff, which is what, as content creators, we really, really want, right? right. We, you don't have to market to them nearly as hard. So you got, <laughs> you've got the, the distribution point of the library, and then now you've got the platform of uh, the Comics Plus digital library uh, thing. I, I just don't see any way anybody loses in this situation. Well, and yeah, that's typically the things that are win-win-win. You know, or that's when it works is when it's win, win, win on the web. And that it tends to, you know, if it's a win for the publisher and a win for the library and win for the patron, you're in business. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the things we've seen so far are a win for a publisher, a lose for the library and a lose for the patron. Right. You know, but we're still buying them because we feel we need to, you know, and and this is what's refreshing about this is it, it works all the way around. And uh, we, we should also say, I, I just want to give this a plug uh, as another way to say wh how great AADL is, is uh, uh, so you talked about bits have it, no inherent value, but atoms do. So you just launched a telescope lending library. That's right. <laughs> That gonna is be a so long, cool. It's going to be a long time before you can download a telescope. <laughs> yeah, that's true. A you, good one. <laughs> <laughs> but these are real nice telescopes. I mean, you well, let me I test mean, one out. It's not a super nice telescope. I mean, well, it's, it's, it's $160 for the telescope itself. Well, but it's, so. it's, it's not, you know, the toy section at, at Meyer. It's above an impulse purchase. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah, I, that's, that's the definition that you always made for this that I think is really interesting. Is Yeah, when it's above an impulse purchase, then, yes, we can collect it and, and, and lend it. But when it's below an impulse purchase, then, yeah. Yeah, it should be essentially free. Yeah, uh, I think that's a good metric to measure your stuff by. Um, and so, be, be thinking about those. And this is this is common wisdom that's been bad well, around for and a long that's time. Really, but that's really the challenge because I think the the dominant mode of content publishing, once <laughs> once the collusion <laughs> falls <laughs> by the wayside, everything's going to be below the impulse point. Yeah. All hot media is going to be below the impulse point. Right. You know because. You know, the app store is working. It's working for everybody. Yeah. Even if you even if you suck at what you do, it's still working a little <laughs> bit for it. You know? So I think what's interesting, and this is why the, why stuff like telescopes are so important for libraries right now, is because I think the most likely media business in the next couple decades will be that almost all media is distributed below the impulse threshold, if not free. Because you get it's just that's the business model that that's the only thing that's working on the web right now. It's the only thing that's working for all audiences on the web right now. So can, if we can t turn this into like three big takeaways between the three of us. Um, so the big idea is get used to the idea that your job is to develop a culture around your intellectual properties and monetize that. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then uh, also think about uh, what are your distribution points. It's not necessarily diamond. Distribu uh, distribution anymore, right? It's it's uh, think about places where there's audiences that uh, hungrily consume all media, so you have a better chance of being discovered, right? Well, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a minute with my book recommendations. Yeah. But a book is something you do for your audience, not to mm. get one. Oh, you know? look at that! Look at that! There's a turnaround. Yeah. So the, the, the Kickstarter backs us up on that. That's Jake right. Parker just launched. Uh, a really great Kickstarter. Uh, he's uh, Mr. Jake Parker on Twitter, and he's doing the Antler Ball. He's already well exceeded his uh, his initial goal, but uh, you know, just he these these were all stories published other places. He's collecting them as a book, and he said, "Hey, I'd like to print this thing. I'd like six thousand dollars." And I think w within the first fifteen days, he was at fifty thousand dollars. Then you make a good thing, and then you make the book for the audience, and they'll support it. Um, Okay, well, I want to get a few other things before we kick into book recommendations because, Josh, you do a lot of interesting stuff. Let's talk about reading with pictures real quick. Uh, sure. I just I just signed up for my forum account because this is a uh, – you're creating an, another uh, – what, what is it? Destination point for librarians, cartoonists, teaching artists, and educators, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, all of the above. The, the idea of reading with pictures uh, is, again, the same thing that, that – led to the creation of, of Comics Plus Library Edition. Um, and it was, you know, me seeing this need uh, for an institution, you know, a, a, an organization that was, that was an institution itself that could attack these systemic barriers 
that keep comics out of the classroom. Again, whether it's research-based justifications, whether it's you know teaching teachers how to teach with comics, or whether it's uh, you know the content itself being aligned to what the schools have to have in order to use it in the classroom. So you know we created reading with pictures to address all of those topics, and then also um, the to add value to what was already being done. So there's a lot of islands um, all across the country and across the world of people who are doing interesting stuff with comics, um, you know, whether it's in classrooms, whether it's in libraries, wherever it is, um, but they don't talk to each other. You know, they don't, in many cases, they don't even know the others exist. I know they exist because I went around and was interacting with them. And I said, you know, I need to build bridges between these islands. Because yeah. if everyone's talking to each other and trading ideas with each other, um, we'll accelerate this process um, in unimaginable ways. Um, and so the Reading with Pictures organization and the forums that we're building and the networks that we're starting to, to construct are designed to accelerate what's already happening, um, as well as provide kind of a one-stop shop um, or anything related to comics in education, um, or comics in the classroom. You come there, and if we don't have the resource ourselves, we have the link out to where you need to go to find it. Um, and uh, you know, you can upload your own stuff, um, your your own lesson plans. You can share your own experiences. Uh, you know, all of that stuff. We want to facilitate that, and we think that the uh, you know once we reach a critical mass with the network, that it'll become this kind of, you know, entity unto itself that'll be a, a real potential game changer. Right. As, as, a, as a guy who does a lot of comics workshops in my area and, you know, v leaves the state occasionally to go visit other shows and I talk with other teaching artists and the, the, the two big things I get are from other teaching artists is, is like, man, this was tough when I first started because I did not know how to break down my medium into something yeah. that was digestible for a crowd. How do you take something as layered and as nuanced as making stories visually and break that down for an audience? That's tough. And then from educators, I get, uh, I do a visit at their school or their library, and they say, this was great. Boy, I wish I could use this in my math class. And then, but I don't yeah. have the time to sit down with them and say, okay, let's develop a, a syllabus based on this. You know, I can follow up with an email or two after that. But really, it's like, wouldn't it be great if there was a resource for both parties to get together and share these, these resources with one another? And so that's one of the things I'm really excited about this project, uh, reading with pictures. Uh, there's also a great video that uh, where on, uh, right on the main page where you ex do a talk at the cover uh, conference, mm -hmm. and uh, you explained your, you know, the whole reason behind it. You, you give all the intellectual justifications for uh, this project, and then you also mentioned your entry point to comics. And I brought my book recommendation based on that. I don't know if you can see this from here. Yeah, I can. Transformers <laughs> number four, baby. This, this was go. the book that that got you uh, started doing this, right? Yeah, it is. It is. That was that was uh, the alpha point right there. <laughs> So, yeah, and, and you know what? Looking back on it and reading it, it's not that great. But, but you know, it, it, it's, it, you, it's funny where... No, and I love Transformers. I mean, look behind me on the, on the wall, right? Uh, but but, uh, but it's, it's funny how, like, any, any comic can be an entry point for falling in love with the medium. Here's a guy who's making his whole life built upon this medium, and it all started with this dippy little uh, licensed comic from Marvel where the writers were just probably going, like, yeah, whatever, I'm collecting a paycheck, right? right. Well, not Bob Bidiansky. He cared. But anyway. <laughs> so, You're killing yourself. <laughs> he wrote every file card for the toys. He, he had to care. Uh, <laughs> so we got to talk about your Kickstarter real quick. We got to talk about um, you're, you're taking this reading with pictures thing to the new level with the graphic textbook. Uh -huh. So uh, you, you did a book called Reading with Pictures, which was a collection of comics where you brought in um, education consultants and experts to work with stellar cartoonists to create great works of fiction that are good for kids to, uh, and, and easy for uh, standards-based educators to use in the classroom. Now you want to take it to the next level. What is this Kickstarter that you're doing? So the graphic textbook is, is our real attempt to create a, uh, a comic project that can be a curriculum replacement. Um, you could drop it into a class and you could teach the stuff that you have to teach, say, the third, you know, the third Wednesday in April um, with a comic instead. And we have uh, we brought in some of the best cartoonists working in comics today, people like Roger Langridge, Fred Valente and Ryan Dunleavy, um, Katie, you know, Cook, Katie Cook, Michigan Cook, native. Amy Reader, 
um, all these amazing people, Janet Lee of the Dapper Men, um, all these amazing people, and said, here's some general topics, which were pulled from the list of common uh, core standards. Again, the stuff that is essentially has to be taught at you know this at at grade four or grade five or whenever, um, and said make a story around some about one of these. They came back with amazing proposals, um, and then we partnered them up with our curriculum team to basically make sure that the story that they created um, would be classroom ready, and then we're going to build. Uh, uh, lesson plans attached to those stories so they can be modular you can use one or you can use all 12 um and and then we deploy it in the classrooms and it's all attached to a uh a major uh impact study that's going to be overseen by northwestern university um that'll be testing the efficacy of of these type of materials um so and you're going to get statistical data then based on the usage of this book after it's made Absolutely. Um, potentially, again, depending on how successful we are in getting it um, placed, it'll be the largest uh, such study of its kind ever done in the United States. Um, and certainly the, the one attached to the most uh, prestigious institution, um, you know, which I don't, you know, no offense to Dr. Rapp, who uh, of Northwestern, I went to Northwestern, you know, I don't, you know, if the data is good, the data is good. But Northwestern is a name that carries a lot of weight, and that's you know one of the reasons that we that we partnered with them. Um, for uh, those who don't know, for those who don't know, in the education field, uh, actual statistical uh, data. Uh, what, am, what am I trying to say? Research data is crucial to a project, isn't it? That I mean, they want hard numbers on things. It's not anecdotal evidence uh, that that doesn't sell anything. You need numbers to show how reading scores improved, how this improved, how that improved in order for something to become institutionalized, right? Yes. Oh, it's it's absolutely essential without um, basically everything's extraordinarily data driven now. Yeah. You can't get anything into um, into a school especially, you know, widespread adoption without a mountain of statistical data at your back. Um, you know, again, or some sort of uh, fantastic pedigree. Mm. What we're hoping we can do with this is, you know, the cartoonists, you know, have legitimacy with, with the students. Um, you know, the educational partners we have are legitimate you know, they're people that done work for Scholastic and Toon Books and all and all these spaces. And then with an institution like Northwestern behind us as well, that should get us in the door. And then the data we collect from that could throw the door open to everybody. And that's really the the main goal is for this to be kind of a um, a pilot project um, for the idea of comics in the classroom in general. Let me let me put it this way. Uh, now I backed the project, and I'm I'm encouraging everybody listening. Uh, there's less, but by the time this goes uh, into the podcast uh, RSS feed, we'll be looking at less than two weeks for this uh, Kickstarter to actually happen. Uh, so I'm encouraging all listeners and viewers to participate as well. But here's why I think this is important. Let's go back 25 years in time, and I'm going to walk up to you, Eli. What are you like? You're 10, something like that, uh, in that neighborhood, and I'm going to say, Hey, Eli. Bar mitzvah age for sure. <laughs> Well, here's your bar mitzvah gift, All is right. that in the future, you're going to be able to check out comics for free from the library. Uh, and, and in schools, your kids are going to be taught lessons through comics. How cool would that be to think about that? And I, to which I would say as a, as a 10-year-old, like, throw away the flying car. I don't even need it. I don't care if I have a rocket pack. I don't care if we got a moon colony. If we've got comic textbooks, and it's okay for me to read, because I, I was the kid whose parents got called in, literally, got called into the school by my sociology teacher because he's just not, he's not focused because he's always drawing those comics, you know, even though I was getting decent grades you know it's, it's worrisome that this, this guy was like in the 60s right. in the 90s you know uh but to think about comics actually being used in a classroom as a real text means that this next generation of kids are going to grow up in a world where comics we just take them for granted it's just like television it's like internet it's like anything right mm -hmm. how awesome would that be that's why i think this kickstarter is really important and people should go back it right now i'm refreshing to see if anybody's doing it <laughs> <laughs> um. And, and one thing I'd also like to throw out there real quick, one of the reasons that we are doing this Kickstarter and taking on all this risk ourselves 
is that we have a very um, uh, we're trying to do right by all the rights holders and our patrons or, and our you know potential customers. So everyone who makes anything in this owns everything of what they make. We pay them a reasonable page rate and we can reproduce it ourselves forever in any context in any country, but they can do the same. So we have non-exclusive rights to what we make. We don't own the intellectual property of what our creators produce. Um, and uh, our digital uh, our digital release, which will be through iVerse as the premium, but it also comes, if you want, with a dear and free print quality PDF. Um, so we're trying to do right by everybody here. And honestly, I mean, we talked to publishers and they saw the value in this, but those were major sticking points that they couldn't really get past. Yeah. And so if you want to see this kind of model um, succeed in the future, um, help us succeed now, because then we can take it back to the publishers and say, this is what works. Here's the audience. It already exists. There's no risk for you anymore. Let's do it. Um, yeah. If you want to see that happen, then help us succeed here. Um, and even if you don't have a kid who's a who would be benefit from this, or you know you don't, you're not a teacher, you're not a librarian, um, buy it as a gift and donate it. Um, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. If you tell us that you want to donate it, you can write that off in your taxes, and we'll make sure it finds its way to a good home. Um, awesome. Yeah, very good points. Very good points that this needs to happen in order for the traditional publishing world to uh, to to come around well and it's an excellent example of, of the the mind shift that's going to be required for publishing to join us in this century mm -hmm. is they need to the things that they are currently looking at as unknown liabilities being the internet as one big question mark on the balance sheet that <laughs> needs to start being seen as money on the table because that's what it is and in in actuality by by attempting to minimize what they perceive to be an unknown risk they're leaving money on the table, mm -hmm. you know, and then that's the, you know, <laughs> I've heard so many librarians say to me things like these publishers, it's like they're in it for the money, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> yes, they are. So you yeah. need to make business cases that work. And as part of the challenge of the whole library advocacy right now is that basically library advocacy is saying libraries are important. Right. And it's like, yes. And where's yeah. the business case? You know, right. so there's, it's it's a challenging time, and I think projects like this definitely go a long way to helping publishers feel more comfortable with things. I mean, you've got the whole in the ebook world right now. DRM is, t is you know, it's hanging by fingernails at this yeah. moment, uh, and it's because they're realizing it's about the only stick they have left to beat Amazon with. Did Pottermore you know? go DRM free? Pottermore is DRM free if you download direct from Pottermore. Okay. If you get it from Kindle, it comes with the Kindle DRM on it. Oh wow! You know, so now that's its own. That's digital dropship. It's its own whole uh, separate business model. Nobody's been able to do that integration. Yeah. It's this whole own thing. But you know, I remember catching your tweet about that about the Paris Hilton comparison. Do you remember that? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I just I, I said that you know that the notion of a putting DRM on a Harry Potter ebook is like pixelating a pop star's limo slip. <laughs> There's nobody left who ain't already you know ain't already seen what they're looking for. Right, right. You know, but yeah. So, okay, well, um, any other final thoughts to close our talk on digital uh, licensing? Um, somebody, uh, Renee mentioned in the chat, the Rob Reed talk, uh, the $8 billion iPod about copyright math. And, oh, yeah. And Eric linked to that. That was very funny. That, that, that clearly illustrated. No, it's not funny at all. <laughs> it's not funny at all. Because that's exactly the types of thinking that is making business decisions in there. Right. <laughs> is that they are seriously equating an iPod worth of music to $8 billion. $8 billion, yeah. yeah. So we'll put a link to that in the show notes. That was a TED Talk. Um, okay, well then let's close out with some book recommendations because I know you brought a big sure, stack Sure, yeah, over I here. brought a couple different things. I brought um, Transformers number four, everybody. Go get it. Uh, yeah. Back issue, Ben. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> so I brought a couple things here of examples of artists who are making it work by giving it away. Okay. And uh, first, I want to start off with, and let me make sure I get this in the right, the right camera up here. Get Sergeant Slaughter out of the way. All right. So we've got here Sinfest by Tatsuya Ishida. This is, uh, in many ways, a grand old lady of web comics. I believe it started before the turn of the century. 
Uh, mm. So Sinfest is a fantastic online comic, and this is published by Dark Horse. And this is a great example. Every single one of these strips is available on right now on his website. He didn't do the user, the, the director's commentary stuff in this. This is just the strips. Just but the strips. This made sense for Dark Horse because he already had an audience. Mm-hmm. You know, he brought his audience with him to Dark Horse. And really, Tats does unbelievably high quality work. He's a very gifted illustrator. Well, an interesting thing by him is he has no online presence outside of the comic, right? That's he, right. He, he's not on Twitter. He's not on Facebook. Nope. He's not posting snarky pictures comic. on Instagram. He just posts the comic, <laughs> yep. and he built an audience that way. And, you know, it has an ongoing story. It's about religion, so nobody's going to publish it in, you know, uh, in the corporate world. Yeah. Uh, but it's a fantastic comic, and like I said, he built an audience, and now he's monetizing it. Mm-hmm. You know, and of course, you know, I, I can't say for sure how well he's monetizing it, but there's so much great stuff in this work. And, you know, he's got a couple of the bonus section here in the back of things that don't appear elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Something unique. So Tatsuya Ishida, Sinfest.com, I believe, is the website for that one. So that's that's one great option. Another one. Here's another example. This was published by, I think this was first for second. second. Yeah. Yep. So this is Derek Kirk Kim, another webcomic superstar who broke out in the, into the, the paper world. And this is called The Eternal Smile. It's uh, 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 written by Gene Luen Yang and illustrated by Derek Kirk Kim. And if you've read any of Derek Kirk Kim's stuff, he's got such a great style, such a very yeah. vibrant, living. I told you the story about how I had a Brian Wilson moment when I read. Derek Kirk Kim, no. same difference. I, I it was it was uh, it was when I was syndicating as a webcomic in two thousand one and two thousand two. Uh-huh. I read it and I honestly, for the first time in my life, considered putting the pencil down. I said, "This is too good. I, how can I ever? Why I don't deserve to draw?" I, I was really shaken up. I was emotionally <laughs> disturbed by how good his stuff is. Uh, so yeah, Derek Kirk Kim, I, I I always recommend him. Yeah, he's a great artist. Just remember that when Wayne and Garth said we're not worthy, they were wrong. <laughs> they were wrong, Jersey. Okay. All right. So, and go ahead, Josh. Side, Gene Yang is Gene. also uh, doing the introduction to the graphic textbook. Ah. Um, awesome. Because he's, he's an educator himself. His uh, thesis was, uh, was a comic about teaching with comics. Um, so cool, yeah. So and well, and plus he has a pretty good pedigree in in, in the comics field as well with um, uh, American born Chinese, right? Mm-hmm. So, yep. but yeah, so you put those two together and you've got uh, you know peanut butter cups. Let's 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 look at the book. So what is what and is what the I love book? about this is that it's got three different stories in it. They're mm-hmm. all the same author and illustrator pairing, and each one of them is totally different. So you've got this first one, which is kind of like a uh, uh, almost a Dungeons and Dragons sort of very typical comic style. Uh, with lots of high detail. Uh, then you have the second story is very much Carl Barks, top to bottom. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is totally a send-up of Uncle Scrooge. Every one of these has a wicked twist in it, and it's just really well-written stuff. And then you've got this third one, which is very indie comic-like, oh, yeah. where you know it's kind of breaking some of the rules, um, has a very restrained palette, uh, and each one of these is just a wonderful little story in and of itself with beautiful illustrations. So this comes highly recommended, and again... These guys, their business worked because they already had an audience. Yep. This book wasn't their breakout, you know? Right. Then I want to talk about uh, uh, one of the bad boys, perhaps, <laughs> of, of, publish, of uh, comic publishing, James Kachalka. Uh, and what is most interesting to me about James is that he is not afraid to simultaneously be a kid's book creator yep. and a totally non-kid's book creator. <laughs> I mean, this is a guy who's best known for Pinky and Stinky and Johnny Boo, mm-hmm. two totally kids-oriented thing. He also has a show in development with Fred Raider called Superfuckers. Yep. You yep. know, so you can make it work on both <laughs> ends of the spectrum. You don't have to pigeonhole yourself. And part of it was he didn't decide to pigeonhole himself. And he has such a... His writing style is so characteristic, and you know you see it in the the, the Superfuckers ground uh, graphic novel, which is being adapted. Mm-hmm. And you know he's also very open about all this stuff on his blog, so you can really follow where he's going. Now he sells subscriptions on American Elf. Mm-hmm. I think it's eight dollars a year. You can get the bonus comics, and it, there's only like four or five of them in, in a given year. Right. But he's got a lot of subscribers there. His super fans sign up to pay for extra American Elfs a few times a year. Right, you know, I mean, he's putting his kids' drawings up on uh, into his stream. There's all kinds of stuff. So, so you're you're showing that there's more to this than just making a T-shirt with a funny saying on it. That's right. Right. It's, a, it's a, you know, it's about diversification, just like any other business. Right. You want to have many different revenue streams. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. And when you're thinking about a project, I think you should be thinking up front 
about your monetization options for the project. Not that it drives your artistic decisions so much as just as you're doing it, oh, that would make an awesome T-shirt, mm -hmm. or that would make a mug, or I better be sure to have them drink out of that mug in panel 12, <laughs> you know, or, or, or those kinds of decisions. So Kachalka, of course, super genius. I love his stuff. Uh, AmericanElf.com is his journal comic, which just lets you know exactly what's going on in his life. Yeah, no yeah it, it really does. He doesn't hold anything back. <laughs> and then here's just one more example, and of course, this is pretty high profile, and I think most people know about this. Yeah. This is the graphic novel adaption of Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog. And, you know, can you think of a more non-commercial beginning than Dr. Horrible? Right. I mean, it was, they were, you know, it was during the writer's strike. They yep. didn't know what else to do. They couldn't do anything using unionized writers. So they put together this little video. They released the whole thing for free. Mm -hmm. They monetized it later. You right. know, they didn't start saying, "Okay, how can we make money with this?" They started saying, "Let's make something awesome." You know, I think I think you just identified the hardest part. It's like with all of these barriers getting knocked down and all this stuff available to us in like five bucks a month, you can start to think. Now the hard part is, is how do you make something awesome, right? And right. and it, and I think in a lot of these cases, this wasn't about them thinking like, what does the audience want? What 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 are, what are people buying? What are they buying? Because you look at James Kachalka. 35 years ago, there's no way that would have been on comic stands. Yeah, no fancy, fancy Froglin's Sexy Forest would not, have, <laughs> would not have made it to many library collections. It, it took him to say, well, this is what I want to do, and then do it. And right. then the audience came along, right? And I think that's the hardest part. I think it's the, big, uh, the most difficult part for uh, ma it's makers of stuff to wrap their brain around, right? It's like, like Josh, when you were doing Mail Order Ninja, that wasn't you sitting down going like, okay, what kind of marketable words can I throw into this mix? I mean, you know when something feels like it's got legs, but, it, but when you're starting, you don't just start with like a focus group saying, like, what are the things that you like? And I'll make a thing about that, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, it has to be, um, for me anyway, it, it was a story that I found amusing, um, you know, and, and something that I liked. Um, and, you know, what I always say to, to people, you know, who come and ask me for career advice, I say, make something that you like, and if you do that, then everything else is gravy. Like any success you derive from that um, is just is just a bonus. Um, but if you've made if you brought something into the world that didn't exist before, but you wish it did, um, then how awesome is that? Um, right. And yeah, monetization you know is important for me. It, when Mail Order Ninja hit, we got a you know I was going to self publish it. Um, we were going to self distribute it. We entered Tokyo Pop's Rising Stars of Manga contest in 2005, won the grand prize, and got offered a book deal immediately. So, like, it, it was like this. We were instantly in the game. But then what happened was the book was released and, you know, to a big resounding mat to, like, the, the direct market. And the bookstore market didn't really still know at, in, 2000, in 2006 how to deal with manga um, yet. They'd started to figure it out. They certainly didn't know how to deal with uh, American artists who were influ influenced by manga, and they had had no idea yet how to how to sell kids graphic novels, um, and that's what drove me into the schools and libraries because they got it. I mean, they more than half of my sales. Um, you know, we talk about thirty forty percent. For me, it was way more than half of my sales were in directly into schools and libraries. Um, and that's what led to reading with pictures. I mean, honestly, my failure in the direct, my straight up failure in the direct market is what led me to go to schools and libraries. And that's what created reading with pictures. So, I mean, thank God the direct market completely rejected mail order ninja outright because otherwise <laughs> my life would be very different. And I think the poor are for it. Um, and well, yeah, I mean, I think you've got to, you've just got to make something that you believe in. And then you can create a model after that. The model, the business models will often reveal themselves to you if you're smart and you're willing to work at it. Because, I mean, a lot of people, I think, want to be company men, you know, for lack of a better term. Their goal is to get a get nice, a stable, yeah. for what counts as stable in comics, job, writing. What counts for know, stable in anywhere, actually. Right. I mean, that's another yeah. fallacy, right? Benefits. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, benefits, okay, I'll give them that. But... But yeah, stability yeah. Is, 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 is a nonsensical thing when you think about it in, in any economy. But go ahead. Sorry, Josh. No, I mean, I think a lot of them, and I, and I was one of these people. Like my, the apex of my career ambition was to like write Superman. And I've done it, um, you know, but it wasn't, you know, it was, 
it was great, but it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. You know, we have all these preconceived preconceived notions about how this stuff is going to work. When you get there, it's not what you think it is. And what I discovered was there still wasn't that security there. The Fortress uh, of Solitude was just a, a work freezer that really needed to be defrosted. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They were saving on the on the heating bill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're 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 talking about what Merlin Mann dubbed the frozen poster. Is like the po- you make a frozen poster of the thing that you thought you were gonna do when you were a kid, and then you if you start to deviate from that, you're like, oh, I'm failing, I'm failing, I'm failing. Well, what if that thing that you froze into that image isn't really what you were supposed to do in the first place? And you find that out when you get older. Uh, if anybody wants to hear like a whole hour on that, then go to the Five by Five podcast. Uh, he does a show called Back to Work where he talked about that at length. Uh, yeah, a race car bed. Uh, that's that's the kind of thing. <laughs> that, is, that, is that what you wanted? Is that you, you, you don't have your race car bed and you're a grown-up. I guess you failed. You know? Well, I think there's one more kind of takeaway as, as we're talking through this that I just want to touch on in that, yeah. um, you know, a lot of these projects are sole creator or a group of people trying to entertain each other, mm-hmm. you know? And I think that it really says something about the division between, uh, in comics, writing and illustrating and that you should write for you, yeah. you know? You should write the story that works for you. Uh, but you should illustrate for your audience. Mm. You know what I mean? You want to make you you know you want it to look good to you. But especially when I hear you, Jersey, talk about you know struggling with perfectionism in your work. Sure. sure. And I'm you know as a, as a as a manager of creative professionals, I'm always pushing the good enough. Yeah. You know, Kachalka understands about good enough. You know, yeah. I don't think he spends as much time drawing as he does writing. Right. You know, yeah. I mean, it's probably pretty much the same process. But if you write for you and you draw for them. You know, you can have a, a a pretty good, pretty good package together there. But I think the hardest thing about this business model of just be awesome, <laughs> yeah, is there's no refuge for the poser. Yeah, and in the yeah. in the publishing world, you could say they don't appreciate me, they don't understand me. True, the poser can have refuge, mm-hmm. having to not face that maybe they don't have the skills or the talent. So I think that that's one of the real challenges on, on the internet, or may, on the internet, everyone can tell you're a poser, right? Yeah, you know, I think yeah. that that's that's the equivalent. Is that you know, if you put your stuff out there for free to a global audience, and there's still no one, yep, you know that 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 can be tricky. Well, but th- but then 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 that's uh, if anybody who's like, oh, well, then I must be a poser because I don't have the big audience or whatever. But that's just a clue to you to try something else. Then I guess, right? Well, and keep working to build your audience. You yeah, know, work with others. Just, and... Yeah, just work hard. Yeah, the first two years of doing my online comic, there was like fifty people reading it, and then something happened that third year when a lot of people started reading it. Right. So uh, yeah, there's also such a thing as perseverance as well. Yeah. Right. So anyway, there was a lot of heavy thinking for a lot of people today. And gosh, thank you guys so much for that. Uh, we've got some events coming up at AADL. Do you have anything going on that you wanted to make a mention of? Um, you did the Let's big see. telescope launch. Yeah, telescope launch. Uh, we've got uh, the, the last key for Treasure Quest will be launching, I think, probably later today. Uh, and then Summer Games starts June 15th, so that's coming up really soon. The one oh other thing gosh. for the... For the, uh, for the uh, Astro- astronomically interested is, you know, there's going to be the only transit of Venus during our lifetime is coming up. I believe it's June 5th, something like that. So we'll be having a special program at Traverwood uh, uh, where we distribute the glasses so that you can look at the sun safely, watch the transit of Venus. But if you want to see Venus go in front of the sun, this is your chance during this life. Wow, so cool. <laughs> well, Talk t- about unique opportunities. That's at what the I library. was <laughs> just going to say. An experience you can't get anyplace else. Come to the library uh, and watch Venus pass in front of the sun safely. Uh, and then also Saturday, this coming Saturday, if anybody's listening locally, uh, there's going to be the Family Comic Jam at the Ann Arbor District Library. I'm going to be leading a workshop uh, where uh, I'm going to take families and break them into teams where, okay, Junior, you're going to be the penciler, uh, wife, mother, you're going to be the inker, dad, you're going to be the letterist, and we all work together to make comics as a family. A family event to commemorate Free Comic Book Day, which is this weekend. Uh, and Vault of Midnight's going to be providing free comics at the Ann Arbor District Library for that event. Uh, if you are not in the Ann Arbor uh, area, you can go to uh, freecomicbookday.com to f- use the handy store locator to find a comic shop in your area to get some free books. Uh, and then also Sunday, uh, May 6th, we've got the uh, Ann Arbor Comics Artists Forum, which is a free get-together that we hold the first Sunday of every month. Uh, Gail Williams of patbird.gailsore.com is going to be leading a demo on flatting, digitally flatting your comics, and then it's followed with some general just j- drawing time, socializing time. And then Monday, this isn't an Ann Arbor District Library event, but it's an Ann Arbor event, we've got a passel of Australian cartoonists coming into town, and they're going to be meeting at Roos Roast in, uh, on Rosewood in Ann Arbor from 5 to 8 p.m., 
And it's just a big drink and draw. Drink coffee, draw comics. Uh, but you don't have to draw. If you just want to hang out with a bunch of Aussies who make comics and talk about how their beer is bigger than our beer, uh, or their knives are bigger than our knives or whatever, uh, you can come they on. They hate that, by the <laughs> way. They don't like the knife joke. Yeah. I'll bet. But do you know what they love in Australia? What's I learned that? this on my trip. The Blues Brothers. They love we the Blues it. Brothers in Australia. So Really? Did, did you ever get to the bottom of that? I did not get to the bottom of it. I think it. that might be one of those frozen posters. It's like, <laughs> that's America. You know, in 1979, Belushi and Aykroyd, right? <laughs> so the French have Jerry Lewis, and they have Belushi <laughs> and <right>. Aykroyd. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll take that. You know. I'll have to do a screening of it then during the drink and draw, see if, if the Australian cartoonists go crazy. But yeah, we got like like five or six different uh, cartoonists who are doing like a tour across the U.S. They decided that Ann Arbor should be a stop. Why? Because this is a great place for comics. So uh, that's uh, that you can find at comicsaregreat.com. Uh, just look in the events listing and towards the bottom of the page. You can find information about where Ruse Roast is if you are in the area. I, advi- I encourage you to come, whether you are a, car- a cartoonist, a writer, or an educator, or a librarian. It's going to be a fun time. So, uh, Anything else that you wanted to throw a mention about, Josh? Um, just that uh, you know, the Reading with Pictures website is open for business if you're you know, one of those people. If you're in that space, you know, we, want, we want you there. We want you talking about what you do sharing it and becoming a part of it and um if you're a library or a school library and you'd like to sign up for our open beta um for comics plus library edition uh that's open now just contact me directly and we'll get you in there and then of course you know the the immediate thing is the kickstarter for the graphic textbook um you know if you believe that comics can make a difference in classrooms um and if you uh you know want to support that cause uh then please go uh, and help we need you know we're we've got less than two weeks and we've still got a ways to go we're doing great but every every donation and every pledge counts right now yep and i mean just with 10 bucks you can get a pdf of the book when it's done so i mean that's right. that's a pretty good deal that's that's a, that's ten dollars well spent it helps a lot of people so that you sh- they should go there and yeah and i should say also yeah the the iverse uh media's comic plus library edition uh, to all those librarians that I talked to who said we don't have a budget, you have no excuse now because you can really, there's no, there's no risk of entry in joining the beta and you can control exactly. the costs. So uh, all the infrastructure is being provided for you. So anyway. Uh, but yes, thank you so much, Josh. It was really fun talking with you today. Thanks for making time to be here. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. I hope I will see you at Kids Read Comics one of these days. Uh, I... If I hadn't have just moved to the West Coast, I would have been there this year. Um, but we're going to try and arrange it uh, for next year for sure. And okay. we're going to see if we can get somebody from Reading with Pictures up, even if I can't be there. That would uh, be super cool. This year, too. So, Yeah, that's the other thing. Uh, Kids Read Comics is coming to the Ann Arbor District Library July 7th and 8th. Mark your calendars. If you are coming, you better get your hotels now because Ann Arbor is notorious about... Uh, having very, very limited hotel space. You're going to have to stay in Milan or something like that or, or Celine in order to actually be able to, to come to the show. So, uh, yeah, uh, information is at kidsreadcomics.org and soon at comics.aadl.org. So thank you, Josh. Thank you, Eli, so much. This was, this was a super fun conversation. Uh, and, oh, yeah, we should say, where can we find you? Oh, I, you know, I'm, I'm around. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Ulotricus. On the web, Ulotricus on the web. Yeah, just do a search for Ulotricus. He's at Ulotricus on Twitter. We'll link to him at his site in the show notes, and we'll link to that talk that you did. Because I, th- I do think that most people who make stuff and deal in stuff that is made should be watching that to learn about Internet culture. I think you defined it really well. Uh, so, okay, everybody, this episode will be uh, available after the fact at comicsaregreat.com slash CAG55. Until next time, two weeks from now, I have been Jersey Joseph, comicsaregreat.com, and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye.